In the headlines, the Ministry of Tourism launches a consultancy to develop a cruise tourism policy and action plan. The onslaught of Black Sigatoka forces farmers to take a more concentrated approach towards root crop production. And Dominica seeks to increase its appeal to international sailors in an effort to boost the yachting sector. I am Andrea Levy with the Channel 5 News, back with the details after this. Thank you for staying with us. First up, in the face of the dreaded black cigatoka disease affecting plantain and bananas, some local farmers have embraced a number of root crops as a more lucrative farming opportunity. A retired hospital worker of Good Hope is one of those into farming on a larger scale. She cultivates cassava, yam, and dashin. Before, while I am Working at the hospital, I used to do my little farming while I'm, when I'm off. When I'm off, I'm not working, I do my farming. On a larger scale, no. All right, what sort of produce are you involved in? I involve in um, cassava, yams, dashin. I used to plant sweet potatoes, but because of the sale before, I just forget about that. But I'm on a large scale now with um, farming because it has more money. Like, like my yams, I produce it to the Princess Margaret Hospital. So I say that is my market. You understand me? My foreign, we church, Asta fans, these people are my market. So I try to produce for them as much as I can. If I don't have, I ask somebody else to bring it for me and then I distribute it to them. I want to plant some hot peppers now to see how I can boost up. Bell's farmers want to make the most out of their dashing harvests. They are plans to get into the processing of dashing. We've been planting dashing on a large scale. We sell to Dexia. But this year we have been experiencing some problem because actually it seems like we had a glut on the market. There's a lot of dashing on the market and things have been going very slow for us. They are relying on support from the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, AICA, and the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARDI, to assist with the dashing processing. We have our building, but we are not fully operational. I feel that we haven't taken, maximized the, um, the use of dashing because there are a lot of other um, products we could make from dashing. We could make chips, we could make, um, as we understand the Trinidadians are making bread from it, they crush it and they make bread from it, you know. We could cut it into chunks, peel it and cut it into chunks and that is what we're working on. That is to, um, to peel the dashing and cut it into chunks, package it for cooking. So we hope that um, we'll get the, the necessary um, um, help assistance. We don't have equipment yet, but we have we have um, we have um, Ica, we have um, Cardi as well, and they are working with us to see that we get those equipments. Up north, Octavia Hunter is part of the largest women's farmers group. With a boost from the Canadian Fund, they have been growing onions for the past five years. We do onions. But we still have other crops like we got from the Jeff Small Grant. We got a rabbit project, which we have rabbits. So there are a number of us, there are about six of us with rabbit houses. And we grow our rabbits, we sell and it's very good, it's doing well. So we have about 17, 17 active farmers. You know, everybody have different crops. Like I do passion fruit. I'm specializing in passion fruit. We have those that do sweet potatoes. We have some others that do um, some vegetables like that. Everybody have their separate crop, but we just have an additional thing like the onions, the rabbit, and so on. We do tanyas, to me and my husband, we do tanyas, and we sell for Dexia. Like two weeks ago, we sold, um, three weeks ago, we sold about 500 pounds, you know, that kind of thing. So you, you and they said, for yes, for ex um, yes, for export. Hunter anticipates the Ministry of Agriculture's irrigation system can become operational in order to boost agricultural production in the area. It is just standing there. But you know, as women, we have our farms on different areas. Like I have my farm right at my home. So if I, if I myself could do my irrigation, 
I go run my water. I buy the pipe, everything, but I cannot do it, so I just have them there. At the beginning, we had all little challenges, you know, no water and that kind of thing. But we went over it. Still, we need water because if we have small irrigations, it would be much better for us. And then we have to be, you know, watering if water can and putting hose. On to tourism, the Dominica Marine Association has been exploring ways it can position the island to be more appealing to international sailors. Idona John Baptist has that story. A move to enhance yacht services is one of the drivers behind the country's budding yachting sector. The installation of moorings over the years, particularly at Newtown and Prince Rupert's Bay in Portsmouth, has made a world of difference in the number of sailors visiting Dominica. Newtown attracts up to 45 yachts during the peak season, while up to 80 yachts dock at Prince Rupert's Bay. President of the Dominica Marine Association, Hubert Winston, who also runs the Dominica Marine Center, says he is encouraged that the yachting sector continues to show promising growth. We as a marine association, we cover the whole island and we promote the whole island. So Rosa South, as far as extended south, we're looking at places like Sufria Scott said to benefit from the yachting sector. Um, Roseau itself has been uh, a beneficiary of the yachting sector for many, many, many years, um, as well as Portsmouth and Miro. So we're looking at uh, the, the idea and the, the opportunity to expand the, the, the coastline for yachting within the, um, within the island of Dominica for sure. There are more providers in the business, there are more people that are actually paying attention to the yachting industry on the island. Prince Rupert's Bay in Portsmouth is considered the prime spot for yachts. A major setback to Roseau's coast is that it provides little protection from sea swells and it's also difficult for yachts to moor on the dock at Newtown. Roseau has been a secondary favorite because it's closer to the capital. Uh, there are a lot of activities could be done in Roseau, in Roseau proper, in talking about the valley and um, areas, the Trafalgar Falls and the whole works. So Roseau has its, its, its charm. Uh, Roseau also has its importance. But in, in for the development of Roseau, Roseau has been developing uh, not as fast and as bright as Portsmouth would have because Portsmouth has notoriously been over the years a great harbor, a great protected harbor. But as a secondary post, Roseau has been doing really well. In Roseau, it's very difficult for yachts to moor on anchor, so they have to get a mooring, and that's one of the other issues that why yachts tend to go to Portsmouth, because Portsmouth is shallower, you can drop anchor, or you can pick up a mooring from Pays, and uh, it's part of the area where we are, and that's why now there's a lot more moorings being, being installed in, in, in Roseau that will alleviate the problem. Notwithstanding the limitations, Winston says yacht tourism on the Roseau South has organized tremendously, creating a lot more economic opportunities. We used to be one of the only docks in Roseau that would accommodate vessels for fuel and water, ice, etc. Now we have other docks that have been installed that are providing similar services. But we are still the only one that provide fuel. What we have been doing now is to increase the yacht services that have been providing and to also to provide even added benefits to yachts within the region that are would potentially pass Dominica Strait to come here and spend a week or two weeks participating in certain events like as we just did we just had the um, the wonderful yacht appreciation week these are events that we are actually putting forth to to highlight Dominica as a destination for yachts uh, it's partnership with PAYS, partnership with Tourism Authority and, um, and other private sectors who are also um, boosting Dominica as a yachting destination. We have had people from far as Asia, um, Scandinavia, uh, Norway, Denmark, Sweden. Um, they come here and they fall in love with Dominica. They spend, they come here. Usually they would do a, a delivery on their way south and they would stop here for fuel or water or just to, to rest their head. And they would spend a month, you know, two weeks, three weeks, and just fall in love with the island. The peak sailing season runs from January to April. Idona John Baptist, Channel 5 News. On to other lead stories now. While the Dominica Social Security is moving to roll out a pilot health insurance program as stipulated in the last budget presentation, 
St. Lucia, the Prime Minister, is suggesting that perhaps a regional health insurance scheme could form part of the future of healthcare in the OECS. Alan Chastanay says health insurance is one of many areas where he could see the sub-region working together. In my country, we cannot afford the current system of health care that we have. It's not delivering what we're supposed to be. And we believe that we need to go to a health care insurance. How much more advanced would this region be if we could collaborate and obtain a singular health care insurance program? So instead of having 67,000 people from St. Lucia, you could potentially have as much as 600,000 people from the OECS. And how much better off would we be? And this idea of health excellence, meaning that each of the countries are going to have an area of excellence that they're going to provide. If you have now a singular insurance provider, that is a way of ensuring that we have the level of integration in this, uh, in, in this area. Shastane believes foreign affairs and regional travel are two other areas OECS countries can tackle jointly. Can we continue to afford to have our own embassies all over the world? And while I appreciate and respect the need to have our own individuality, maybe through the ambassador, but can we have now functional cooperation within the office where the research officers and the technical officers are on a shared basis? I've spoken for many years and very loudly as to what my personal feelings are about aviation. But the fact is, is that when we look at the reports, the number of people traveling with this, within this region has shrunk. Just in speaking to some of the people who've attended the meeting here today, who've come from a, not so far abroad as just within the OECS, the difficulty that they had getting here. But we have to be able to tackle this problem because we are not truly going to have integration until it is cheaper and more affordable and easier to be able to access each other. The Independent Regulatory Commission, IRC, is stepping up to its corporate responsibility of educating the public on electrical hazards. This as the IRC embarks on an island-wide campaign targeting secondary schools in the first instance on health and safety practices with a view to reducing and eliminating the number of unnecessary injuries or even deaths caused by exposure to electrical hazards. 14 secondary schools have been contacted for this campaign, which is set to get underway on Thursday. Over the years, we have all become familiar with electrical-related incidents occurring in areas where they negatively impact health, property, and the environment. Most of these incidents can be avoided as many of them occur because of negligence of some kind. By focusing on school children, we hope to have a greater impact on households as the students would serve an, as an effective medium to transmit the information to their immediate families, relatives, neighbors, and their friends. And if all goes according to plan, we should have covered approximately 85% of the schools by June of this year. According to research by the IRC, there have been three deaths through electrocutions from 2012 to 2016, and the Commission sees public sensitization as key in reducing the effects of electrical hazards. Since the IRC is the regulator of, for the electricity sector, and this sensitization is mainly geared around electrical-related hazards, the Commission has enlisted the support of Domlik. The presence of a Domlik employee would provide students with the opportunity to direct questions relevant to the presentation to Domlik's personnel. Brochures will be handed out to students, which will serve to further enlighten students and ultimately the heads of their households about the role that the IRC plays as it relates to ensuring health and safety and to guiding them about their rights as consumers of electricity, because they do have rights. The IRC operates under the motto, regulating electricity, promoting our energy. Coming up, meet the lucky lotto winner, who is over $400,000 richer. Welcome back. 
The Ministry of Social Services will have to seek legal advice on the future of a local government for Petit Savan in light of the impact of Tropical Storm Erica. Idona Jim Baptist explains. The displacement of residents of Petit Savan since the 2015 Tropical Storm Erica could affect the continuation of a Petit Savan Village Council. It's still not clear whether a next election of a Petit Savan Village Council will be held ahead of a proposed September nomination day. That, according to Local Government Commissioner John Fontaine, would have to be reviewed. Among the matters to be considered is that the Petit Savan community will be relocated to Bellevue Chopin. With the relocation in mind and construction have started in the Bellevue Chopin area, it poses a challenge to the Department and the Ministry of Social Services as to what happens to the Petit Savan Village Council. Um, given the fact that they are, the community will be relocated uh, or the resettlement will take place in another local authority, um, within another local authority boundary. And so a case will be presented to the minister and um, we will seek legal, legal minds on, on, on the matter. Fontaine describes it as a challenging situation. The, the plan is for them to be resettled in two separate areas within Bellevue Chopin. Maybe if it was one, it could have been easier um, in terms of revisiting the boundaries of the Bellevue Chopin Village Council. He says the current Petit Savan Village Council has been allowed to function since the storm due to special conditions. So people are displaced and um, we have persons from Petit Savan living in many, many different parts of, of the island. And so to, to have a tracer on these people and to ensure to provide them with their the relief supplies and the other needs. You can understand without the, the, the institution of local government what would have happened. A special case was made within the ministry so that they could continue again to provide that level of assistance to the social services technical team and other go government established um, committees, um, cabinet appointed. Um, and also coming from that there was um, a broad base committee, the uh, resettlement committee of Petit Savan, which included council, councillors as well. We were able to um, piggyback on their knowledge. Um, they had a count together with the health team in the area as to the number of families and where they live and who was missing and, and, and so on. In that case, the, the role played by the local authority is highly recognized. Um, and commendable. Edward Thomas is the current chairman of the Petit Savan Village Council. Idona John Baptist, Channel 5 News. The government, through the Ministry of Tourism, is focusing its attention on developing the tourism sector through upgrading tourist attractions. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Karen Prevo, commissioned the consultancy project to develop a cruise tourism policy, strategy and action plan on Tuesday at the Gary Hotel. She says that based on current bookings, 265 cruise ship calls are expected for the 2017-2018 season. We are looking forward to doing some street enhancements, improving green spaces in Roseau, and continuing our cleaning works. Now, as far as site enhancement is concerned, we do have major enhancement works ongoing at various sites and facilities. Of course, some of the works were started prior to the cruise season, and some we have had to put on hold because of the traffic that we have currently. But as soon as the season closes up in April, uh, May, we will see some more works being done, particularly to the Trafalgar, Freshwater Lake, Tito Gorge, and um, Wharton Waven and Emerald Pool. Now, the ministry, has also been engaging community groups to enhance beach facilities. As you would probably see, we've done some work in the mirror area, Salisbury, Purple Turtle. The ministry is assisting these community groups to provide beach amenities for the cruise calls and also to enhance the beachfront landscaping and just general enhancement of the community areas. We have also embarked on ecosite um, enhancement in the communities and in this financial year, we have been doing some work in um, Vilcas, in Thibault, Opak. We are doing a trail to a bat cave, very interesting. 
and um, the Cold Sufria, we have recently completed the rehabilitation of the trail to the Cold Sufria. So there is a lot ongoing at the Ministry of Tourism in terms of enhancing our sites and preparing for our cruise and stayover visitors. The project is being facilitated by consultants from Cruise Consultants Consortium. Prevo explained that the purpose of the consultancy is to assess the current status of tourism and to review, analyze and integrate previously produced development documents on tourism. We also plan to define a consultative process and mechanism for the preparation of this cruise policy and cruise tourism strategy and action plan. And we do hope to take into consideration the involvement and the, the comments and feedback from the key leaders, organizations, and entities in the public and private sector, which is the reason why you are here today. We do hope that this cruise policy and action plan will assist us in developing the overall vision, as well as defining strategies, policies, and an action plan for each area of concern, but not limited to tourism planning and product development, marketing and promotions, standards and accreditation, manpower development, investments, infrastructure, transportation, environment, culture, gender and poverty reduction. So we do have a great task ahead of us. The past year has been characterized as a challenging one for the OECS Commission. The OECS Commission is an administrative body comprising the Director General and a Commissioner of Ambassadorial Rank named by each member state. The Commission has reportedly been navigating financial and other constraints that have impacted its ability to execute planned programs. The just concluded 64th OECS Authority meeting in St. Kitts was told that the difficulties faced are the same ones faced by member states and they have had to find more cost-effective ways of working. The central theme of the meeting revolved around collective positioning in a world in which all grounds are shifting, all alliances are fluid and the old certainties have become the new unpredictables. The authority will be pleased to note that for the period 2015-2016, we recorded an 81% accomplishment on our key performance indicators. Performance matters. As protectionism unravels economic interdependencies and the politics of identity moves to center stage, the only viable option for survival for small vulnerable economies like ours will be to find common cause. Now is the time for us to press harder on the pedal of regional integration so that we can stand stronger and taller in the face of these storms. Jules says the way to go is to have what he calls a deeper convergence of effort and resources. Whether it be in extending procurement of medicines to the pool procurement of essential supplies and widely needed services, or the use of virtual working groups comprising the best expertise in member states in trade, diplomacy, tourism, health, etc., to design common approaches to optimize pool resources and to strategize in our dealing with the wider world. Distinguished heads and distinguished colleagues, the OECS Commission is moving rapidly to structure and position itself as a facilitator of deeper and wider collaboration from the top floor of decision making to the ground floor where implementation and delivery happens. And after 15 years of playing the lotto, a young farmer and construction worker of Castle Bruce has won the $430,000 jackpot. Gavin Laville picked up his symbolic check at the Dominica National Lotteries on Tuesday for winning the regional Super 6 jackpot. Well, I'm excited, as anybody would be excited. 450,000 is a good sum, so. A lot of things I could do that morning. Most importantly, I want to take care of my mama. Yeah, and my daughter just started, <laughs> just started um, secondary school, so I think that morning could be a good thing to so, a future education, secondary and university college. Lots of other things I could do because actually I'm, I'm a farmer so I could enhance myself probably 
go to something new, get myself a vehicle or something. Just do my, put my money in the best use, bank my money especially. No squander, I'm not a squander, so. Marketing manager of DNL, Ken George, says over $5.2 million in prize money was paid out in 2016. And we have also invested into sports, culture, good causes. And we introduced new products and we are still going to introduce other products in, the, in Dominica. So that in itself has changed lives. As you can see, the example here today of $450,000, that in itself is a major impact on the, the economy overall of Dominica. That's news. Your sports highlights next with Kenny Williams. First up in sports, two games are scheduled this week in the Dominica Football Association's Division I League. On Wednesday, Harlem will take on Club Lubia at the poor playing field from 6 p.m. in the last game of the preliminary round. The first playoff match will feature Gully Dream Team and RC Doctors on Thursday at poor playing field at 6 p.m. Other games will be finalized after Wednesday's matches. On to international cricket, India leveled the Test Series against Australia one all to win the second Test by 75 runs on Tuesday. Resuming from 213 for 7 at the end of Day 3, India was bowled out for 274 in 97.1 overs. C. Pujara added 92 while Abrahani supported with 52. Josh Hazelwood picked up 6 for 67 for Australia. Set 188 for victory, the Aussies fell short and were bowled out for 112 in 35.4 overs, with the highest figure by an Australian batsman in that match being 28. Our Ashwin was the star bowler from India's side with six wickets from 41 runs. Final scores from that match, India 189 and 274, Australia 276 and 112. Meantime, Public Relations Officer at the Dominica Cricket Association, Augustine Pascal, says the general cricketing family here is pleased with the improved public presence of the body. He says positive change is a must if the local cricket product is to improve. People are happy. People are generally happy. I mean, we haven't had uh, some, that kind of event in eight years, probably around there, but it could be eight or ten years. We have never really had a ball around. Cricketers are starting in secret and you know how I feel about that you know I mean there's no way cricket should be played in secret cricket is too much a part of everybody public cricketers spectators stakeholders um, sponsors for for you to tell me you're running a cricket and every year you start it in silence that's not gonna happen no more a number of changes will be made to the runnings of the intermediate and premier league moving forward we're gonna be pushing for for um, a man of the match award. We do believe people should play cricket and when they do well, like they take a five wicket haul or they make a century, that that should go unnoticed. It's not fair to them. It should not be the end of the season where they'll be recognized. They gotta be recognized at the game. So that is what we're striving for. We gotta be very serious too about teams coming to play on time too. Um, we do believe that it's, it's, um, it's prudent for people to walk in any time and come and play a game. So we're going to be implementing penalties for that. It might be in runs or, you know, or whatever. But we, we're still in the works of putting things together. Um, but there are a lot of things you're going to be seeing different. In basketball, Dominica State College boys beat Pierre Charles Secondary 96-23 in action from the Sports Division Under-20 League on Monday. For DSC, JV Bellot got 18 points, Joshua Henderson 16 points, 8 assists, Aaron Hippolyte 16 points, 6 rebounds, and Jaden Laura 12 points, 8 rebounds. For PCSS, Yawani Regis 14 points, 7 rebounds, and 1 assist. Sports continues with this item where four teams have recently booked spots in the semi-final round of the island-wide White Oak Rum Domino Competition in one-sided quarter-final matches. Dangerous public enemies de destroyed Mount Zion by 1,396 points. Scores enemies 4,024, Mount Zion 2,628. Dolphin also overpowered Tremors by 1,141 points. Scores 
Dolphin 4022, Tremors 2861. Wake Up Stars also defeated one case by a thousand points. Scores Wake Up Stars 4010, one case 3010. And Rockers made light Wake Up Stars, beating them by 975 points. Scores Rockers 4010, Stars 3135. In semi final matches on Sunday, 12th March at 12 pm in Portsmouth, the dangerous public enemies will play Rockers and Wake Up Stars will play Dolphins. They'll be next reporting for mapping spots in track and field where bram sanderson came first and kevin pierre clocked a personal best time in the fox mile pioneers athletics club one mile road race the event was won by bram sanderson in a time of four minutes 41.3 seconds bram was unattached rick timothy of the pioneers athletics club was second in a time of five minutes 07.6 second and kelly pierre of the pioneers athletics club was third in a time of 5 minutes 33.2 seconds. Keva Pierre of the Pioneers Athletics Club won the female category in a personal best performance of 5 minutes 41.3 seconds. Next up, plans are in the pipeline to fast track the establishment of more up-to-date sports and facilities here. There was a recent visit to Puerto Rico by myself as the Minister of Sports, um, the Permanent Secretary, Mr. Trevor Schillingford and Mr. Sorrendo, where we went to look at some of the indoor sports facilities that they have up there and to see how well we can use some of the designs that they have and to incorporate it to make sure that it can suit our climate and our, our environment. So we have done that as a result of that. We are expecting a visit by some a team from, from Puerto Rico sometime next week. Finally, the National Bank of Dominica Primary School Girls Football Championships will kick off on Wednesday and Thursday. This year, 16 schools are expected to be part of the girls' competition. The Woodford Hill Primary is the girls' champion, while St. Mary's Primary won the 2016 boys' title. That's all the sporting highlights for now. I am Kenny Williams. Join us next time. Stay tuned for your weather forecast. Good evening and welcome to tonight's weather broadcast. I am your presenter, Annie Coretta Joseph. We start off this evening by taking a look at earlier visible satellite imagery, which showed mostly low-level clouds over the region throughout the course of the day, resulting in partly cloudy to cloudy skies. This was as a result of weak, unstable conditions generated by a southwards dipping, dissipating frontal boundary over the area. Radar imagery indicated some scattered showers in the area during the afternoon. Conditions for tonight, partly cloudy to cloudy and windy with some scattered showers. Tomorrow, partly cloudy to cloudy skies and windy with some scattered showers as well. Sea conditions, rough in open water with northerly swells expected to peak up to 12 feet. A small craft warning and a high surf advisory are in effect for above normal seas and brisk winds. Persons, especially on the western, northern and eastern coast, you are advised to be vigilant and to exercise caution. Taking a look at conditions for the next three days, weak and stable conditions will continue to affect the area, resulting in tomorrow Wednesday partly cloudy to cloudy skies and windy conditions with some scattered showers on thursday cloudy to overcast at times with showers and on friday cloudy to overcast at times at first becoming partly cloudy with some showers by afternoon some windy conditions can be expected throughout the week Across the region tomorrow, weak and stable conditions will result in partly cloudy skies with some rain over the northern portion of the island chain, cloudy skies with some scattered showers over the central and southern portion. On the international scene, partly cloudy skies in New York and Miami, partly cloudy with some rain in London and Caracas, and clear skies in Beijing. The sun will rise tomorrow at 6.18 a.m. 
and set at 6.15 p.m. For up-to-date information, log on to our website at weather.gov.dm or call the weather hotline at 447-5555. Thank you for viewing and join us next time. Good night. To end the news, the headlines again. The Ministry of Tourism launches a consultancy to develop a cruise tourism policy and action plan. The onslaught of Black Sigatoka forces farmers to take a more concentrated approach towards root crop production. And Dominica seeks to increase its appeal to international sailors in an effort to boost the yachting sector. Feel free to contact us at news at marpin2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the entire production team, I am Andrea Louis, and to all our viewers around the world, thank you for watching. Join us next time.